Hey, thank you for coming. My name's Belinda Scarlett and I um, work for Sporting Heritage alongside Kate Turner, who you can also see on the call. Um, we're coordinating this series of webinars. I think a few of you have been to the other webinars as well, so it's, it's really nice to see you again. And our presenter today is Christian Allen from the National Football Museum, Communities and Public Programmes Manager. Um, who will be telling you all about his experience of delivering virtual learning sessions for lots of different audiences throughout um, lockdown. Um, there'll be a chance of a Q&A at the end, but if you want to pop any questions that you have throughout the presentation into the chat, Kate and I will try and keep track of all those and we can raise them at the end if we need to. And there will be a breakout room part way through the session so we'll divide you into two or three rooms at that point and you'll have an opportunity to to chat through some of your sort of personal experiences and, and what you want to try and get out of the session as well um i think that's everything for now if you like i say any questions or introductions just pop them in the chat it'd be nice to to see who's here and and what your background is as well and now i'll hand over to christian Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, as Belinda said, um, I'm really happy to be doing this uh, Sporting Heritage talk today. Uh, I'm the Community and Public Programme Manager at the National Football Museum in Manchester. Um, and yeah, it's been a, been a funny time, I'm sure, for all of us. Um, so hopefully some of the experiences that I've had over the past nine months, ten months, delivering um, digital learning content and virtual school sessions and um, age-friendly programming online um, will hopefully um, help you all out. Um, the presentation I've got isn't, I don't think it's particularly long, um, so hopefully there's plenty of time to look at individual scenarios and case studies and um, where each of you are, are coming from. And I can try and pass on um, some tips and advice um, and also sort of refer you, I suppose, to some of the places where I got tips and advice at the start of all this as well. Um, just a quick word of warning, I suppose, I'm using an external mic and webcam. So if um, you have any trouble hearing me, um, maybe just signal with your uh, icon, put the hand emoji up or something if you're having trouble with anything. Um, and it's snowing severely where I am. So um, I hope we don't impact the Wi-Fi or anything, but um, yeah, we're, we're gonna be snowed in, I think. Just to take my camera off for a second and show you out the window, if you can see. Uh, it's yeah it's been snowing all morning so it uh i don't think we'll be going out today at all i think um the chances of us being able to get out of our front door might be uh might be pretty limited um cool so i'll um share screen then and um, we'll get started Okie doke. Hopefully everyone can see that and I'll go into um, a wee slideshow as well. Just give that a second. Great. So, um, yeah, the session today is all about delivering a virtual learning session. Um, so there's a bit of practicing what I preach, hopefully, and what I'm, what I'm telling you today. Um, yeah, there might be a couple of examples of stuff that I'm not showing sure best practice of today. So um, follow the PowerPoint perhaps and not my presentation. Um, so just quickly then, uh, some introductions and expectations for today's talk. Um, as I said at the top, I'm the Community and Public Programme Manager at the National Football Museum. I manage our communities team and um, that sort of follows our age-friendly uh, our schools offer, our early years offer and our public programming. I'm not really going to be touching too much on our events and public programming today. I'm going to focus more on our schools program, our sort of family learning offer and our age friendly offer. So what we do with our sporting memories group in the case of the football museum. Uh, just quickly, if you are on Twitter, you can follow um, our department at NFM Communities or um, at Sport and Heritage, obviously, for, um, for Belinda, Kate, and the rest of the guys. So, um, and there's also some of the things I'm going to reference today, um, YouTube, I'm going to mention a few, uh, a little bit. Um, you can find the National Football Museum. Please subscribe to us. It's something new we've started really over lockdown. It's National Football Museum. And I'm going to talk about classroom resources and most of our classroom resources are on Padlet, which is one of hundreds of websites you can use 
um, for school resources, I suppose. But um, yeah, that's our account there. And before we get going, um, I just want to take a quick second for a sound and sight check. So yeah, it looks like you can all hear me okay. Um, but just take a second, uh, make sure you're happy with the lighting in your room. As I said, it's snowing a lot here, so it's quite dark. I've got a couple of lights on. Um, so um, I'm just going to give you 30 seconds if you think you need to turn the light on or close a blind or you'd rather sit in a different spot in the room. We're all kind of accustomed to sticking in the same space. I've consciously um, chosen to do this presentation in a different room from where I usually work. Um, so yeah, just take a quick second there to, to make sure you're happy with where you are and the lighting and the sound setup as well. Great. Okay, hopefully you're all sitting comfortably in that case. I went to a talk recently and they asked um, participants before it started for you to go into an area of the room that you don't usually go into. I'm not sure what they were getting at. I suppose it was all about perspective, but yeah, it was an art gallery and they sort of asked you to go into like a corner of your room that you don't usually go into, which I was a bit confused by. I thought there's obviously a reason I don't go into this corner. It's because it's not where I usually go, where I usually sit. Uh, we will have a breakout room as Belinda said, and there will be a short break as well um, if we have time. Um, okay. So um, hopefully you can see this okay. Um, this is a very short scale of three images in terms of um, digital confidence and literacy. So I'd just like you to put in the chat where you fall on this scale. We have on the left-hand side, our Luddites smashing up um, textile machinery. Uh, are these guys, um, are you channeling these guys when it comes to digital communication and virtual learning? Are you sort of at the point of smashing up your laptop and all the tech? Um, so that would be the far end of the scale. Is that you or you're a Luddite? I'm a bit of a Luddite to be honest, or at least I definitely was nine months ago. Um, are you Jose Mourinho here in the middle? I'll be in the football museum. There are a couple of football analogies in this session. Are you sort of fed up with the amount of options? Are you pretty tired with being on Zoom calls the whole time? You know, we all get that like that from time to time. So you sort of mid-table, you're happy with um, your tech setup. You're confident to some extent, but you're kind of um, pretty fed up with how much time you're using on tech. Or are you a wizard of tech? So on the far right-hand side, we've got um, so Stanley Matthews, the wizard of dribble. That was his nickname. Are you a tech wizard? Um, are you pretty confident with using tech? Perhaps that's not the issue. Perhaps it's marketing to groups. Um, so yeah, just let us know in the chat. Are you more towards the Luddite scale um, in terms of your experience with tech and delivering virtual sessions? Or are you a tech wizard like Sir Stanley Matthews was the wizard of the dribble? Uh, and are you pretty confident with tech and it's more, you know, developing sessions or marketing sessions that are aware that, you know, where you're facing trouble. Um, so have a quick look at the chat. Um, down the middle, lots of people down the middle, a bit like Jose Mourinho. Uh, yeah, somewhere down the middle. So I think at this point, you know, even the, the most staunch of anti-digital, anti-tech um, um, museum and heritage professionals probably are somewhere down the middle now. Um, so, you know, I think um, much like Jose Mourinho and, and some of the football managers who don't always look that comfortable when they're doing Zoom calls and Zoom press conferences, they've had enough experience at this point to be somewhere away from being a Luddite, but they're perhaps not, um, you know, that confident or perhaps not enjoying it all that much. And that's fine. And we are going to talk a little bit about things like presenting into the void, which is one thing I really wanted to cover because, um, yeah, one thing that I suppose um, Zoom presentations and virtual sessions don't prepare you for is sometimes you're you're delivering to a you know, blank room, essentially. Um, so we will cover that today. So, yeah, I'm somewhere down the middle as well. <laughs> um, but hopefully some of the experiences I've had and some of the work I've done and some of the programs I've used, which I can share with you today, will, will help you guys out as well.
Okay, so um, I lifted some of the um, reasons for attending from um, our pre um, the sort of questionnaire that went out prior to the talk. And um, these are some of the things that came out. I don't know where to start with virtual sessions. Um, I need to know what we can deliver quickly and easily. We don't necessarily have the skills needed in our team. I'm not confident using digital technology or new technology. I think um, most of you dispelled that and we're all pretty confident now with Zoom. What if the Wi-Fi isn't working? Um, so we're gonna cover that today. That might be something that comes up with, with me. We'll have an example of it today. My Wi-Fi can be patchy. All options for digital delivery are overwhelming. And how do we generate an audience? Um, which is definitely something that we've had to um, consider when we've been delivering online sessions. Uh, the good news is that everything we'll talk about today will be able to replicate. You'll be able to replicate um, everything that we've that I've shared has been delivered through lockdown and with a pretty limited team um, who have either furloughed or flexible furloughed. Um, so you know, working part time that that includes myself. Um, so you know, kind of time poor with de developing some of this. So um, hopefully, something that you know you can pick up with with however little time you have. Uh, everything can be leveled up. So um, we, we've been fortunate enough to get some funding from Museum Development Northwest um, who recognized the need for more digital school sessions in particular. And we received some small funding, a uh, recovery funding for us to develop our digital schools offer. So at the moment, a lot of my job is sort of leveling up without sounding too much like um, a member of the government, levelling up, I know Boris Johnson likes that phrase, um, levelling up our schools offer. And we'll also look at different audiences, as I said, um, and we'll have a bit of time with each of those. So the first thing, and it's an obvious one, is know your audience. Um, so I know we're from a pretty wide range of organisations and community trusts and um, venues um, looking at the audience list, but um, you should hopefully have a pretty decent grasp as to, to what your audience is. So to give you a little bit of background, 2019-20, um, which was the last full um, school year, or almost full school year um, for us, or financial year, I should say. So for the financial year ending um, March 2020, so just at the start of lockdown, the National Football Museum welcomed 14,000 education group visitors. Uh, so that's a little drop on the previous year, but that's partly down to a lot of cancellations in late February and obviously all of March. Um, and there's a slight tilt towards secondary school. And the great thing about sporting heritage, I suppose, is we'll predominantly be talking about why that is today. Um, and hopefully that'll help you guys out in terms of sports um, and, and football history and sports history. Um, and then on top of that, about 2,000, we had about 2,000 visitors who are from age-friendly and adult learning groups. So by that, I mean, um, you know, adult learning groups through our local council, maybe um, in Manchester, there's a group called Manchester Adult Education Service, groups who are ESOL learners, adult ESOL learners, so English as a second language, um, reminiscence groups, uh, a lot of community trust uh, age friendly groups from community trusts so you know local football teams even teams you know in west and east midlands and down south will bring age friendly groups um, to the museum and um, so uh, yeah that's that's sort of a decent um, amount of our visitors come again from age friendly and adult groups we knew that there was a need for those as well our school tagline is use the hook of football to bring your school topic to life. Um, so we knew that was still going to be a focus. We weren't going to start looking at other subject areas or um, try and butcher our standard school offer to um, accommodate for what teachers were, were teaching at home. Uh, so we wanted to sort of stick to that, obviously, with our offer. So these are the three questions that I think you, you need to ask yourself, and I'm sure you, you already have, but um, what we asked uh, back in March was, um, for our department, was where was their most demand? Um, so in terms of our school's offer, where would we still get demand, you know, even though we were closed, even though we were delivering from home? And it was clear to us that 
that would be our secondary school and post 16 group. And that was because we have a really strong GCSE and an A level uh, offer. So um, hopefully you're aware, but uh, GCSE PE and A level PE, um, BTEC Sport, um, they all look at some variation depending on what um, exam body uh, the school decides to do the qualification with. They'll all look at the early history of sport or post-industrial sport. Um, sport and society is a module that we get a lot of success with. Social cultural influences of sport, so things like fan behavior, commercialization of sport, um, player conduct, sportsmanship, gamesmanship. Um, and that's brilliant for us. You know, we rely a lot on those areas of the GCSE and A-level PE curriculum. And with the sessions that we deliver, catering for those areas of the curriculum, so early history of football, um, looking at post-industrial sport, how football, you know, boomed in the Victor end of the Victorian era, looking at commercialization of football. All those sessions are quite lecture style, so we knew we'd be able to deliver them relatively easily online. Um, you know, the groups who are booking those sessions wouldn't have the added experience of an actual physical museum, but we knew that we could deliver the classroom element of their, of their booking, so we could still honour a lot of those sessions and be able to do them justice online. So we knew that there'd be demand um, for that area of our offer. And we knew that that was probably not going to take us too much work to be able to tweak those sessions that we deliver usually in the museum so that we could deliver them uh, on Zoom calls. Secondly, where's the most, where's their most need? And that was 100% um, our age friendly offer at the museum. So the National Football Museum has two Sporting Memories fortnightly groups that meet on Mondays and Wednesdays, usually in the museum. And we also have a dementia specific group as well, who are a much, a much smaller group um, who meet fortnightly as well. Uh, with their carers, it tends to be sort of three or four people in their carers, so a much smaller group. And the Sporting Memories group is more, well, we'll go on to it, but it's more like a cuppa and a biscuit and a chat about football. And we knew that the museum had a responsibility to continue these during lockdown. So that was that was where our biggest need was as an organisation. And finally, where was their most opportunity? And yeah, it goes without saying that, um, you know, digital platforms were a bit of an afterthought for us previously. We focused on delivering to groups who visited the museum daily, doing sessions, tours. We didn't always have enough time to produce video content or audio content, you know, stuff for things like YouTube and Facebook. Um, but we knew that we could, with our digital collection and with a pretty strong image library that the museum has of our, our objects, that we'd be able to grow that, you know, we, that was a good opportunity for us. So they were the three questions I think you should ask yourself before you deliver any se sessions or be put any together. Where's their most demand? Where's their most need? And where's their the most opportunity? Um, so the other questions, I suppose, and, and these are things, again, you'd have by this point asked yourself, I expect, is what platforms do you have experience using? Um, have realistic expectations. You know, we weren't going to replicate the amount of visitors we have to the museum um, in our digital and virtual delivery. What do you have that's unique? Um, ours, you know, we're really fortunate, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you, you guys are too, that perhaps the topic that um, you're covering or that you want to cover, in, in our case, football, gets a lot of column inches. So, you know, football is always in the news, obviously, on the front and back pages some of the time. So we knew that's, that's a, a strong point for us. We have a pretty good handling collection in terms of handling objects that we had access to in, in you know, perhaps not at the moment, but certainly earlier in lockdown and earlier in 2020, we had access to, um, and we knew we could incorporate that into our offer. And as I mentioned before, we had a we have a really large image library, which before this was only really used um, as a reference point, I suppose, or for research purposes. But um, having thousands of high res images of your collection is pretty useful when you're when you're trying to put together a digital offer. You know, you don't have the objects 
physically in front of you, but you can incorporate them into your presentations and the content you're producing. What level of digital confidence do you have or your volunteers or your staff? Ours was a mixed bag. Um, I have some experience of audio editing and a little bit of video editing. Uh, the same with one member of our team, but all four of us ha had rarely done any digital delivery. And as I said, we were sort of working part time as well. So we didn't always have a lot of time to develop new stuff. And in terms of the museum, another one of our strengths, I suppose, was that we were collecting through COVID. So one thing we wanted to make sure is that we were incorporating some of those new objects that we were getting from donated from football clubs that were reflecting football's reaction to COVID. Um, we wanted to incorporate that into our offer. So the next question, I suppose, is what does virtual mean? Um, and this is something that which I think can be quite daunting, I suppose, uh, and certainly was to me at the start. You know, there are dozens of platforms, you know, hundreds of platforms, I suppose, to choose from. And um, it's worth just sort of whittling down what you're most confident with, but also what your audience are looking for. Um, so virtual doesn't need to be a Zoom call or, you know, video content. It can be written. It can be yeah, video, audio, it can be live or pre-recorded. It could be free or charged. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff we're doing is still free. We are charging for some of it now. It can be, you know, really highly produced. Um, I don't know if anyone on the call here was on the um, session that my colleague David Mansell did um, prior to Christmas. You know, we're really fortunate at the museum to have a digital producer who can produce a really high quality, high standard for some of our video content. But at the same time, not all of it needs to be high quality. It depends what your audience is. Virtual can be as simple as a one-to-one -one Zoom call. It can be a blog post. It can be classroom resources. It can be a written um, worksheet that you scan in as a PDF. It doesn't need to be high tech or high quality. That's the first thing I would say. And certainly with school audiences, the teachers aren't necessarily confident or they aren't necessarily looking for high quality virtual content. Um, a lot of the teachers that we've worked with, you know, use at the moment, we'll be using simple PowerPoints. We'll be using written uh, worksheets that they've scanned in. You don't need to be a whiz on, you know, all of Adobe's software to, to be able to deliver um, virtually. You don't need to be good at video editing or audio editing or graphics. Um, sometimes, you know, simple stuff is, is what your audience are after. And certainly with our age friendly audience, that's been the case. Um, and then it goes without saying research and ask your audience before deciding on a platform to use. I'm sure you've been doing this, some of this already, but these are some examples for you. So I've taken some screenshots from um, some of the research we've been doing. Um, this was just to give a bit of a contrast, the um, part of our survey monkey. So the, sur the online surveys that we send to teachers when they have a school session with us. This is from the 2019-20 uh, academic year. And you'll see we've had um, 100, very neatly, 96 people have answered this, four people have skipped it. So 100 uh, completed feedback forms. And the majority, nearly all of these were completed prior to COVID. So the majority of these would have been completed this time last year, so September, October, November, January time. And you'll see here that there's a trend towards low tech. So when we've asked, asked the teachers what additional museum learning resources would be of interest to them, the things that have come up on top are session worksheets. So simple printout worksheets that they can use either in the museum or in a classroom, interactive quizzes, um, which again are relatively simple to set up and we'll, we'll talk about that. Loan boxes, so there's definitely been a return to loan boxes, you know, people who've worked in museums for 10, 15 years or, or even longer really, loan boxes have been pretty established for years now, decades um, as a museum schools offer. And um, that, that, you know, came up quite high on these results, but also things like assemblies, which obviously we're not able to do at the moment, um, came up pretty high. What was low was 
you know, a museum YouTube channel, um, video workshops, because it wasn't a priority, you know, this time last year for, for teachers. So things that were um, relatively low tech, things that were stuff they could take back to the classroom and things they could incorporate into other lesson plans beyond their visits. They were the things that were coming up as the most popular. If we then look, and this is a smaller sample size, but if we then look at um, the feedback from teachers during lockdown, you know, none of them are asking for assemblies, obviously. None of them are, are really asking for um, worksheets. Instead, they're asking for, um, in the case here, the thing that's, and this is slightly different because with this feedback form, we asked them to, to prioritize them. So to list them from um, first to fifth, I suppose, or first to sixth, I think there's one that didn't get anything. Um, and the one that came out on top was pre-recorded uh, video workshops. And we'll go on to this, but certainly what I've noticed this time round over the last month, as opposed to the first lockdown, is teachers are a better set up now to deliver from home and teachers are delivering perhaps an hour two hours three hours a day from home from what i can tell so far you know a couple of hours a day delivering from home but they're also putting in pre-recorded content and if you can offer pre-recorded content that teachers could easily stitch into their lesson plans you're probably going to get more success than offering them something live that's you know an hour, an hour's long. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, obviously, it goes without saying that this feedback form, you know, is quite a wide contrast. There's quite a strong um, angle now towards um, slightly higher tech stuff, but it doesn't necessarily need to be that. But yeah, pre-recorded stuff and things that teachers can incorporate into their lesson plans. If we look at our age-friendly offer, um, this is something we sent out again at the start of lockdown. So this is a feedback form we sent to our existing Sporting Memories members. So again, it's been answered by um, just 22 people in total. So not a huge sample size, but um, I think this is fairly accurate for, um, for our group in general. And what you'll notice here is that at the start of um, the first lockdown, the group were pretty confident using email. They were confident using WhatsApp and um, Facebook. So they were the clear three most popular avenues for us to continue our virtual meetups. The difficulty there is, sorry, there's a motorbike going past you struggling to get through the snow. Uh, the difficulty there is it isn't really that engaging to deliver a virtual meetup over email. We did do it at the start of lockdown and we were getting, we were getting hundreds of emails. So we'd set a theme, a topic for people to discuss and I'd kick it off at 10 30. And for the next hour and a half, our sporting memories members would all be sending emails on the thread about the topic and they'd be overwriting each other and, one person perhaps who's a little bit slow at responding to another person. You know, there's a reason email isn't an instant messaging service. It was quite messy. Um, so pretty quickly, we we had to look at alternatives. And it's funny, actually, I, I looked back at this the other day and I, I thought oh, I must have been really stubborn. But Zoom calls and Skype calls are quite low on the list here. But obviously, people have become accustomed to using these pretty quickly over lockdown. And um, yeah, nearly all of our communications now turn on Zoom, which is great, you know, for our, our group members, because um, it's a lot more engaging. We do have a WhatsApp group for our Sporting Memories um, group. We have a Facebook, um, closed Facebook group for our Sporting Memories guys as well. But uh, yeah, this is this has changed quite a bit, I think, and I should probably do an update feedback form. But I just thought it was interesting looking back and just seeing how our group members um digital literacy has changed um since march and their confidence as well which has been great to see and we'll touch on that when we look at the group in more detail other things to consider then um cost of the organization so in the case of a simple zoom call or a web page most of the examples i'm going to look at today are free but there are a couple of examples that charge so um you get added benefits to having a paid Zoom account. 
um, which we'll touch on when we look at making sessions interactive. There, will you charge for sessions? Um, will they be free or not? We aren't charging for our primary school offer because a lot of it is new and we're trialing it. So um, we, we don't see the need to charge, but we are charging for our post 16 and our sort of secondary school offer and our university offer, which I talked about before, our university lectures, our sort of lectures that we do. And we do charge for those because they're kind of off the shelf and they were ready to go at the start of lockdown. So we, we didn't think we were compromising the standard of them by delivering them online. So we thought we could still charge and, and the groups have been, have been happy with that. Do staff or volunteers require digital training? The setup that you have at home, so we'll, we'll mention this in a second, but um, your lighting, it's quite a dark day uh, today here. So making sure that your, you know, your lighting's well set up. Um, I'm using a museum branded pop-up, um, which I we use on all of our school sessions. Um, so having a pop-up or something like that's great, just in terms of a standard um, background and um, your Wi-Fi strength as well is another thing to consider. And um, we'll go on to safeguarding, but this is another consideration for delivering virtual sessions and something which I think certainly some venues have been playing catch up with isn't necessarily something that's considered given you know, how, how much time we're spending on Zoom calls now. But certainly in terms of schools, ensure there's always a teacher present. Make sure you're streaming from a suitable room. Um, so do you have a branded pop-up banner that you can use in the background of your calls? I mean, it makes it look more professional more than anything else, um, but it, it obviously is better than having, you know, personal posters or stuff in the background. Do you have a virtual wallpaper? So I've seen some great examples actually in some venues who've talked about um, commissioning artists to produce like murals as a virtual background that really sum up their school's offer or their group offer, you know, branded backgrounds that they can use um, instead of just, you know, whatever, they're, whatever they usually have, um, you know, a beach or a, or a hill. Um, password protects the platform you're using. Make sure that yours and your participants' name uh, don't display their whole names without permission. And don't share screenshots and photos without teachers or participants' permission as well, which is tricky because um, when we go into marketing these sessions, you know, having photos of a group on a Zoom call isn't really much to look at compared to photos of a school group in the museum, you know, trying on different, you know, handling objects and trying on different uh, football kits and outfits. That's obviously a much more appealing photo than just a photo of a class looking at you on a Zoom call. Um, so thinking of a way that, you know, asking the teacher in advance, can they get some promo images of the, of the students um, watching the session at their end? Or can they get some photos if you've got sent a loan box to the school? Can they get some photos of the loan box or just the 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 children's hands handling the loan boxes if their faces can't be in shot? And um, so yeah, you have to get creative, I suppose, in ways that you can market these sessions and ways that you can promote that you are doing them. And I've got a couple of examples later on as well. Establishing your values with the sessions, so um, making up. Uh, you know, key for us was making sure that our learning content and sessions built on our established offer. So anything that we offered over lockdown would, um, you know, wouldn't be a complete departure from what we were doing in the museum prior to lockdown. Any of the sessions should um, have the museum's collection and themes at the, ins at the, as the, at the heart of them as the inspiration. Um, and again, we were lucky that we had a lot of images of our collection that we could use in sessions. Ensuring that our online content was accessible, and this is really tricky, uh, and there's some great, um, again, there's lots of training for this online, you know, a paid Zoom account, Microsoft Teams, um, Google Classrooms, they're the three big ones, they all have a version of closed captioning, so they all have a version of subtitles um, for, for live sessions. They're not always accurate, especially if you have a broad accent, but um, there are examples, you know, on Teams, Microsoft Teams, on Google Classrooms and on Zoom, 
there is an option to put on closed captioning and subtitling, which can be useful from a, an accessibility standpoint. How you can include um, sensory, that's a really tricky thing. Um, so we made sure that we, we already had these smell jars that were just in our classroom, you know, in boxes in our classroom. So we made sure that these smells, the smells of halftime oranges, of boot polish, of um, changing rooms, I think is one. A, a beer is another one, sort of smells of football fans. Cigarettes is another one. Um, liniment, um, Olber soil, you know, sort of smelling salt, stuff like that. Um, incorporating those into your school's loan boxes. So posting them out to the schools if you can. Um, Bovril as well. So stuff that you don't necessarily need to get from a specialist um, supplier. Just, you know, get some um, Olber soil and some Bovril um, from your, from your um, supermarket and incorporate those into your loan boxes. And uh, we also try to incorporate audio into our sessions as well. Um, so I'm going I'm to show you that now. Um, and in fact, I don't know if I am sharing sound. Um, so let's quickly just check. Uh, yeah, share computer sound. So this might not work, but anyway, it's an example. We've got a bunch of them. Um, so that's a football rattle <laughs> so just incorporating if you if you didn't hear it I'm sure you can imagine but um yeah incorporating sounds into your presentations as well so we've got um and there's a bank of these online just search on YouTube or on Google just just search you know crowd noise or football rattle noise or um you know noise of football tackle I don't know I should have thought of some more examples but the ones we use in school sessions are um a um in our football and local history session we use um crowd noises from a manchester city match and from a manchester united match so like chants common chants from united and city games um that don't include swear words of course and uh, the sound of a football rattle sort of generic crowd sounds as well the sound of a goal being scored the sound of a penalty being missed um, things like that, you know, just trying to incorporate some sensory into it because it is really tricky in this medium with a presentation to, to do that. I thought he was going to play the rattle noise again then. Um, and then we had to think about writing new content. So as I said before, we had a few lecture style talks that we didn't really need to alter for our secondary school and post-16 audience. We had four um, lecture style talks that are linked to GCSE PE and A-level PE and BTEC sport and um, we've got one for leisure and tourism as well around um, sports tourism in Manchester which a lot of colleges book for travel and tourism type courses and they didn't need altering um, but what did need altering were our primary school offer because they were quite tactile they were quite hands-on they incorporated elements of the museum galleries, which obviously we didn't have anymore. So we only took, and again, it's about being realistic. We only took um, three of those sessions. We basically said, which three of these are the most suitable for online delivery? Which three of these will there be the most demand for? And which three of these can we turn around the quickest, I suppose? And they were the three that we got funding from Museum Development Northwest to develop you know, and develop resources for which which we're doing at the moment, albeit it's a little delayed with everything that's happening. And one of those sessions was actually entirely new. So two of those sessions were sessions that are part of our core offer anyway. One is on um, local history, so football and local history, which is on the key stage two curriculum uh, in England. And um, they look at um, elements and key figures in local history. And a lot of schools in Manchester and Greater Manchester tend to book that with us. They use football, understandably, in Manchester United and Manchester City and famous players from Manchester. They'll use those as the example when they do a case study um, in year five or year six on local history. So we knew that was an important one to develop for online. We also did our First World War session. So we have a session called Greater Game, which is all about football and footballers who served in the First World War. And we knew that come October and November around Remembrance um, that there'll be a demand. There's always a demand from 
schools for that as well. So again, year four, year five schools will book that session every year with us. So we knew that those two sessions incorporate elements of the galleries, they incorporate objects that are in the museum. They incorporate a lot of handling objects, a lot of dressing up elements, a lot of um, replicas that we could turn into loan boxes and send to schools. Um, but we also knew there'd be demand with those two. The third one was linked to um, our a funded project that we had that we knew would be a priority for us in 2021. And that was um, a funded project for our Lily Par statue, which you can see here on the slide. We knew we we knew we needed to develop some sort of a schools offer for this statue and for the exhibition that goes alongside it, which um, Belinda's all too familiar with being the lead on on the project. And we knew that we'd need to, um, you know, um, trial sessions with schools and we saw this as an example to trial sessions and to get feedback from schools as to what they wanted in terms of a school's offer for, for Lily Parr. Um, so we tried to use a standardized script template, so the same script template that we use and I'll share this with you after the session, you can just take it if you want. Um, I actually just lifted it from, um, I used to work in um, the radio industry and it, I've just lifted it from a script that we used um, when I was at Radio 2. It's just the script that we used for um, scripting shows on, on the radio and, and sort of putting in a, a, a track listing and things like that. So that's where I've got it from initially. Um, so a standard script template with learning outcomes, with timings and activities. And we trialed these sessions. Um, we did a little bit in June and July, but predominantly um, October to December. So this is the script template we use. So yeah, at the top, it, we have the location of it. So whether it's in the museum or online, the subject title, the length of the session, the outcomes, and these are lifted. Some of these are lifted from the curriculum. So um, discover the significance of Manchester as a global um, football city. Um, obviously on the curriculum, it would say something like discover and the importance of the student's local area in a global context. Uh, learn more about the key moments uh, in the history of Manchester City and Manchester United and the city's role in hosting the 1966 World Cup. And then underneath the resources that we're going to use for the session and then the script as well. Um, and obviously there's, it's not, it is a script, but I'm not asking people to stick to it word for word and um, verbatim, but it, it gives the facilitator an idea as to how it should be delivered and a, and a structure. So that's uh, an example of how we put together new school sessions and um, live sessions. And we'll be looking at a little bit, uh, a little bit more in, into that um, in the second half of the session. The a couple of other examples I'm going to share today are recorded examples. So again, at the start, one thing we noticed is a lot of, you know, the demand at the moment for more short form contents or five, 10 minutes um, content, that, you know, we can share with teachers that they can incorporate into their lesson plans. So in this case, kicking off your creativity, this is something that we produced that, yeah, there are only short sort of two, three minute videos each of the videos sets a task and it's a creative writing task and it's related to football history. So um, we saw these as an opportunity to produce bite size, very simple um, filmed content that we could put together as a series and we could share with teachers and they could incorporate into their lesson plans when they were looking at key stage two literacy. So sort of writing and creative writing for upper primary school groups so 10 9 10 11 year olds but we also saw it as having a secondary audience in terms of families so especially with homeschooling at the moment that this could be something that families could pick up as a homeschooling resource for football mad kids who are who are stuck at home and um, so this is a screenshot from our youtube channel we've done um a series of these with an author called matt oldfield um, my tip with this one is if there are any facilitators you work with, and there are a few that the museum work with, there's a poet that we, we work with regularly for school groups. There are a couple of children's book authors that we work with regularly. You know, don't feel afraid to check in with them and ask them, 
if they're willing to do something collaboratively. In this case, Matt had put a call out right at the start of lockdown, um, right at the start, sort of mid-March, end of March last year. And because he has a pretty strong um, following through teachers anyway, because he does a lot of school events, as a lot of kids' authors do, he just said, would teachers be interested in me doing pre-recorded video content to help them with their lessons? And obviously we were wanting to do the same and we realized that we could amplify each other if we just sort of combined forces. So, um, you know, Matt is someone we've collaborated with a lot. And I knew that if he produced the videos for us and we tried to make them a bit tidier and a bit swankier and put a bit of production into them, that we'd be able to generate an audience through schools. Um, so this example was nominated for a Kids in Museums Award. So we were nominated for um, Kids in Museums, the, the organization, the charity, did an award um, ceremony just for things that have been produced during lockdown. And this was nominated. It sounds a bit like the Oscars, but we were nominated for Best Film uh, and we lost out to La La Land. No, we, we didn't really. But um, yeah, best we were in the Best Film category for this series. Um, I wasn't too fussed about them being nominated, but what was great about it was actually the feedback we got because in being nominated, they sent our um, the content to their mailing list, and we got dozens and dozens of you know really practical bits of feedback from parents and, and children who'd used the resource as part of um, the award nominations, and. What came out here was that people were interested in rewriting history. So that was kind of the theme of it. You got to rewrite history. Um, they were um, perhaps turned off about <laughs> turned off by um, it being about writing. They didn't really want to necessarily do a writing um, task, uh, but they were interested once they heard they could change history or change the truth, um, which is something that appealed to me, um, getting England to win instead of losing on a penalty shootout in one circumstance. Uh, one thing that came out from our initial series, which I think was really pertinent and something we tried to respond to, was there were a couple of people that said um, that there were no, um, it was all male examples. So all the examples we used from the first five videos we did, well, four of them were, um, all five of them were men's football examples. And one of them actually was Pickles the Dog and then 66 world cup so the story of pickles the dog finding the 1966 world cup and at the time matt and i hadn't really spoken about examples i just let matt choose the examples that he you know he wanted there wasn't much consultation but the feedback certainly reflected that we needed an example from the world of women's football and um i was a, a bit embarrassed actually that we hadn't considered that earlier um so this was an example that we came up with and we put this one out at Christmas time um, to coincide with the an, an anniversary. Um, I'm going to try and play for, play it for you now and um, just briefly, but um, this is the latest one we've done. So I think we've done six in the series altogether and they all have a similar format to this. Hi there, Matt Old here and the star of the show, Claude, although I think he might be asleep. But anyway, we wanted to give you a special festive treat. And so here it is, the kicking off your creativity Christmas special. And we're calling this one. Oh dear, might cut out to test of my Wi-Fi. What if women's football hadn't been banned? Now, for the background story, I'm going to read you a little bit from my book, Unbelievable Football. Okay, during the First World War, 1914 to 18, women's football had become one of the most popular forms of entertainment. With the men away fighting for their country, the women had stepped up to take their places, both working in the factories and playing on the football pitches. In fact, some female footballers became international superstars and huge crowds would come out to support them. And there was one totally awesome team that ruled them all. Ditka ladies. Now, on Boxing Day 1920, so we're celebrating 100 years this year, Ditka ladies took on St Helens ladies at Everton's Goodison Park in front of, wait for it, 53,000 people. 
and there were thousands more waiting outside who couldn't get tickets. It was a new record crowd for a female football match and a clear sign of just how important and successful the women's game had become. But sadly, it was all about to change. So only a year later, in 1921, the FA decided that football was quite unsuitable for females. And that wasn't all. They also came up with a really unfair new rule. Women's football matches were no longer allowed to take place at FA grounds. So basically, women's football had been banned. And this really unfair rule lasted for 50 years, all the way until 1971. But remember, this is your chance to rewrite football history. So in your story, what will have happened? Okay, will Dick Kerr Lady still be the top team in the country? Will the women's game have grown and grown and grown? And will the Lionesses, the England Lionesses, will they have already won the World Cup? Maybe with you as their superstar striker. Who knows? I'll leave it up to you. But good luck and Merry Christmas from us both. So I know that was glitchy for a couple of you, but we'll, we'll share all these links um, afterwards. And um, yeah, I'm not going to play too many videos if it was glitchy for you, so don't worry too much. Um, but that was an example of um, one of the, the series that we've done for kicking off your creativity, which, like I said, was just a collaborative thing that we've done with Matt. Um, we haven't, because he was doing it anyway, we just sort of co-promoted each other. So it's been a really simple thing to organise um and like i said it's sort of a two minute thing and i think certainly going forward and in, into this month and into february i think these are things that teachers you'll get a quick response from from teachers quick little two minute three minute um videos that you can put together that's you know that's been hand filmed somebody's just filming i think matt's partner's filming that on matt's mobile phone with the exception of um, the photo that I put in halfway through and the two branded slides that have the title on the start and the end, there's no editing in that. So we've just, you could use iMovie or Windows Movie Maker. There's no sort of elaborate video editing um, with that at all. And all we've done with that is had an accompanying worksheet that um, sort of starts off the story and then gives people options to rewrite history. So what if women's football wasn't banned? Would England have won the Women's World Cup, you know, in 2019? Would Dick Kerr ladies still be around today? Would they be the most successful women's team in the world? You know, just very simple little story starters and and um, questions that the, the children can follow up on and, and finish and write their own story, I suppose, um, with some example um, adject adjectives and describing words that they can use too. So um, just very briefly, um, because I think this will be a question that will come from a few of you, is where is it best to house these, um, these videos or the worksheets that you're doing? And this is something that I was kind of overawed with when I started. There are lots and lots of different platforms and websites that all claim to be the best website for family resources or schools resources. And um, the National Football Museum doesn't necessarily, our own website doesn't necessarily get a lot of hits for um, our family and schools offer because traditionally people use our website to find out when we're open and to find out how much it costs to visit the museum and to find what's in the museum. Um, so we weren't expecting lots of families and schools to go onto our website to look for this content. So we knew we'd have, have to use a third party site and again, there are lots of examples. I mean, the one that I would recommend, certainly for a family's audience and for home learning, is fantastic for families. Um, it's a really good search site, I suppose. It's well funded. Um, it's got a simple layout. I've got a screenshot on the left here um, of um, our platform, our um, profile on there, sorry. And we put all of our arts and crafts activities on there all of the storytelling stuff, all of the creative writing stuff is all integrated on there. The videos can be embedded. The worksheets can be attached if they're PDFs or Word documents. Um, I, it's just a much better platform than our own website, if I'm honest. Our website's very clunky when it comes to hosting all of these school resources. Um, there are also a couple of local examples. So we use the Manchester City Council example. Um, museums in Manchester have all pulled together to set up a new website for schools in Manchester. So we're using that one as well. So there are, there are loads of examples. 
we still use things like Mumsnet and NetMums for um, our early years offer. But there, yeah, there are loads of websites. And if I'm honest, this is just the best one I've found. You know, in the chat, if you found other ones, do recommend them. But personally, I think this is a good one in terms of how easy it is to use and how easy it is to list the activities and events and, uh, and um, sessions that you're delivering. Oops. So um, the last example we're going to look at just before we go into breakout rooms uh, and we'll come back and look a bit more at schools is our age friendly offer. Um, so here is our sport memories group. Um, as I mentioned, it was an existing group we had in the museum. We um, realized at the start of lockdown that this was probably where the most need was that, um, you know, a lot of the people that come to this group rely on it and it's you know the highlight of their week so we realized that it was important especially at a time where social isolation was being increased uh, and people were stuck at home that it was important that we continued these groups virtually in lockdown and obviously initially we were told through our feedback that email perhaps was the best way of doing it and we still do offer email but um we still do have email chat every week and the whatsapp group and the facebook group but over time it's become a zoom call um we firstly asked the Sporting Memories group to refer a friend, and this was a really quick way of us growing the group. One blessing, actually, one of the positives for us delivering these sessions virtually is geography is no longer a factor. So the previously, the group was made up of members almost exclusively from Manchester and Greater Manchester. Now we don't, that's not necessarily a barrier. So we have three members who are from Scotland, who now are in the group who attend football memories through the Scottish Football Museum, but they wanted another group to attend. We have members from West Yorkshire who attend the group as well. I'm from East Yorkshire, actually, in Hull. So um, that's been one real positive is we got people to refer a friend and we did actually pick up a lot of new members that way without really needing to externally market the group. But we have externally marketed through Manchester's various age-friendly initiatives and through Sporting Memories, the charity themselves. We have got a promo video. I'm not going to play it for you just in case there's any lag, but you'll find it on our YouTube channel. And um, Sod's Law, this promo video, we um, launched as part of a relaunch of Sporting Memories at the start of March last year, so just before lockdown. And we had an event organised with Mike Summerby the former Manchester City player. So we had a former player coming into the museums, this elaborate group for the relaunch. And it was the week that um, the lockdown started. So this video has been a blessing because it shows what the group is like when they meet in the museum. And it's a good marketing tool, but um, we launched it the week that the group's actually finished in the museum and we started doing virtual groups instead. So here is uh, an example of a screenshot. We've got lots, I've got lots of these now. This was um, from before Christmas. And I think there were about 15 in the group, but not all of them wanted to be photographed. And that's something obviously you need to consider. We've had 40. Yesterday was our 40th virtual meetup. We started on the 1st of April. So every Wednesday, essentially, with a two week break for Christmas um, since the 1st of April. And we've had 600 instances of participation. So it does tend to be the same 20, you know, 20, 25 members. I think there's about 50 people on the mailing list for the group now, but it tends to be the same 25 people on rotation. And there's usually a maximum of around 20 who attend the group. Any more than sort of 15, 20, it gets people talking over each other and things. Um, so we haven't had to approach it yet, but we would consider setting up a second group if we were getting more than 20 people turning up to the to the video call. Uh, alongside the video call, we also have a quiz that we do every week, which you'll find on our um, website. So it's on our age friendly page on our website. And um, that's a, just a good resource, the, the quiz. Um, if I exit my uh, presentation quickly and try and show you, it's just a good resource um, to share with the members of the group who perhaps aren't um, wanting to use Zoom. So hopefully you can still see my um, browser. This is the age-friendly page on our website. Yesterday's topic was FA Cup giant killings. So we've got an image from our collection 
and then the quiz is here and we use a website called Sporkle for this quiz um, and Sporkle is like a really simple platform to use it's free to use you can set up a timed quiz um, they just need to type in their answers so for the people who aren't confident going on zoom and there are about half a dozen people in the group who aren't confident using zoom still um, I you know they'll chat on the email thread I'll repeat their answers back in the Zoom call to try and make them feel included. And when it comes to the quiz, they'll complete this version of the quiz rather than the, the quiz on Zoom. And a nice legacy from that is actually all of our quizzes are on our Sporkle account. Um, so we've got, yeah, 43 quizzes now that are on our um quiz page so all the previous ones are still there and we can share them with new members of the group if they want to binge on football quizzes they can do and it even tells you how many people have used the quiz so um, in some cases you know the quiz has been picked up by people who are just searching for quizzes on this platform so you'll see that you know some of our quizzes have had 61 200 over 200 um, people have completed it in some cases but most of them get sort of 10 11 people completing them um, online. Um, great. So, um, yeah, I'm sure there'll be some questions about our Sport and Memories group, and I'm happy to answer them afterwards, but that's just a brief overview of our Sport and Memories group. Right, a chance to chat now. Then we're going to have, um, oh, it's 12. So we're going to have probably... 10 minutes now actually 10 is probably too much so something so we say seven or eight eight minutes let's say eight minutes um we're going to break out into rooms and we're just going to discuss the audiences we work with what sessions we've developed already or wanting to develop what our unique selling point is i suppose what our usp is and what the barriers we're currently facing and hopefully we'll have a bit of time to feed back um, so yeah, seven minutes in our breakout rooms, which Belinda will send us to now. Just discuss uh, the audiences we work with, what sessions we're developing, and what barriers we're currently facing for developing these sessions. So if you just give me a couple of minutes, everybody, you should get a notification to join a room in a second. See you shortly. See you in a sec. Kind of what audiences you've been looking at trying to um, engage really. So anybody like to have a bit of a start? Shall I, um, shall I start? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, so I'm Joanna from the Tottenham Hospital Foundation. So um, we actually right at the very, very beginning of um, developing um, online resources. So this is great. Um, what Christian been um, sharing. And um, so, because I'm also, because I look after the heritage and history aspects of it. So that's what I was specifically interested in what the, Na uh, the National Football Museum is doing, because what the foundation has been doing, they're emphasizing on moving from the football coaching sessions online. And they've been using the Premier League charitable uh, funds um, uh, what you call their their premier star uh, el um, components and elements for those of you who are who are not familiar I, because I'm not sure who I'm talking to at the moment so the the, the foundation has been using um, the Premier League uh, premier star and that's uh, key stage two uh, materials but what we're going to do in this lockdown is to develop key stage three so that's why it was really good when Christian said it like he focused on the secondary school um, uh, curriculum. 
Yeah, that's interesting. So um, I guess it, he was talking about barriers. What Have you got any barriers at the moment to doing so? Um, now, um, I have only delivered um, live. I haven't delivered into the void like what um, Christian was saying. So that was really interesting. So basically delivering with um, maybe with recorded sessions. And, and I'm quite pleased, actually, when the feedback that he's got from teachers. So it's almost like we haven't done any feedback with any of the teachers, especially Key Stage 3 teachers, because the foundation been primarily working with Key Stage 2, and they've been delivering live Key Stage 2 sessions. Um, but for me, I, I actually would like to venture um, into um, recorded sessions because, well, it's more efficient as well, um, because I, I've been repeating myself over and over again while delivering live sessions, I'm assuming. And then, so while I do that, um, it, then for, and then I can't split myself into two as I deliver live, but then, you know, the, the fact that hopefully a recorded session can benefit and will expose to uh, more schools and then they can get that session at the time they want rather than at the time that I'm available. So it, it, I, I think it hit all the spot. And um, so not particularly barriers, but maybe just kind of do it and, and not having to um, um, kind of uh, uh, look, uh, wait and see um, for the for the team to come back. But as I said, is um, because we are beginning to discussing the key stage three and a lot of a lot of us have more key stage two experience. So I, I'm, I'm assuming it's like trialing the, the resources with key stage three first as well. That could be the barrier, I suppose, because we're going into a bit of an area that is not familiar to us. It might be um, it might be a good idea to trial it with a group that you're confident with first that you already know, so that you know if it's a new, if it's a new brand new session, just sort of have a go with a with somebody you're comfortable with. I think that's what Christian would suggest, and we've done that ourselves at NFM a few times. We don't mind mistakes. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it'd be great if I can hear uh, if there's anyone here that like you know they share that kind of. Um, unfamiliarity between key stage two and key stage three because there is hopefully I'm own, I'm, I deliver two key stage three but in person that's what I mean I haven't delivered it online so I'm sure there must be some um, uh, maybe uh, un uncharted territory I I'm not sure uh, I mean I've not got that much experience either but what I have heard is that a lot of uh, the older the children get the less interactive it can be so if it's a live session like um so primary school kids are much more likely to sort of interact with with somebody whereas if it's a university group it's basically just you know silence um and also i think a lot of university students are told to not turn the cameras on for safeguarding reasons to have it on mute a lot which just i think it it makes that more difficult that interaction more difficult it's like more presented into the void so perhaps that's the difficulty with key stage three in particular is how to overcome that that barrier and get some conversations going. Thank you. Rosemary or Jessica, did you have any thoughts about the groups that you're targeting or anything that Christian was saying? Sure, yeah, I can, I can um, have a little spiel if you want. Um, I, I feel like a bit of an imposter because I'm actually here as part of my job for the Dialect and Heritage Project. So not it's not to do with sport. <laughs> But um, I, I came to Sporting Heritage through the National Paralympic Heritage Trust and your, your content and training is great. So I thought I'd hop on. Um, we're trying to develop our, so we, our program is sort of, um, it has an engagement and data collection kind of circle. So all of our engagement activities, we're trying to, to get responses from people that contribute to our research. And so, taking everything online is a real challenge. And, and at the moment we're trying to, um, the reason I thought I'd join this call was because we're trying to figure out how to deliver some of our outreach session, sessions online. Um, some of them I think will work really well, but then the older people, I, I was really surprised to hear how, how well that Sporting Memories group has done. And I mean, the numbers of the attendees has made me feel really positive about actually, I don't know, uh, maybe I'm just assuming older people don't have so much, um, they're not as tech savvy as they really are because that those numbers were ph phenomenal. Um, but I think, yeah, we're, we're pretty concerned about how to, all the things that we were gonna do in care homes, for example, obviously not gonna happen, all the things we were gonna do 
in schools. Um, yeah, we want to, to develop some resources for schools. Um, the, sh the YouTube channel thing is giving me a bit of a kick up the bum. Like I think, I think we need to bite the bullet and, and develop some short form content like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's us really. Yeah. Um, no, that's interesting. I think, yeah, short form and pre-recorded stuff is a really good kind of entry yeah. point and you can get good feedback on that before you start doing any live sessions or anything so yeah yeah I guess the challenge for us is that um all of the engagement stuff that we've planned um because it's also simultaneous kind of data collection for us we really need people to send us stuff back um and so we're trying to design materials like um for example activities that are also going to come back to us so things like postcards people can fill out and then send us the postcard back if, it, if we've stamped it for them or um, I don't know, worksheets and things like that, it, it's just a little bit tricky knowing whether they will ever make, make it back to you. So just, um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on designing designing activities that come back to you in that way. Sorry, I'm, I, I don't have any experience of it, but I can imagine how that combination of something virtual and something mm. real would be really appealing to people. So you, you do an online activity, but then you physically get something that you can then fill in and send back. It almost makes it feel like it's actually yeah. happened. <laughs> I would I would like that personally. So I think that's a really good idea because I've never thought to do that before. Mm -hmm. um, we are trying to do some sessions at the Football Museum with some artists where we might be trying to send out some um, materials. Mm -hmm. So we don't want it to be um, a divide between people who can afford arts materials and who can't. So when people sign up, they can say, yeah, we can't, we don't have football boots that we can dip into paint, which is one of the activities. So then we'll try and yeah. send those out to people. So yeah, I can't really help and say it's, it works, but I think it's an idea that more people are looking at trying to do, do sort of a physical and virtual thing all, all yeah. at once yeah 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 or to I virtually definitely... send um results so like you're saying if you've got something physical you can then post a photo of it with a comment or, or yeah. um as a freelancer and sort of i'm an illustrator and artist that i'm working with uh, sporting heritage and paralympics and a range of other sporting museums um but i also have my own youtube channel that i developed through lockdown um and that's really grown over this period so um, I've restarted it again for this lockdown and it's uh, had 10,000 people um, a reach for the advert the other week, not for the actual channel, but just for the uh, promotion of it, which was just for me as a, an individual ridiculous. Um, so it shows you that there is a need as well. Um, yeah. And people are quite, um, they regularly post what they've done, um, what they created on my Okay, Facebook so you're page. getting quite a lot of feed feedback then. That's yeah. great. Yeah, I mean, I have to ask for it, you know, I constantly okay. in my YouTube channel, remember to, you know, post it and da da da. It's yeah. getting that kind of a bit like um, Christian was saying, that script of remembering yeah. to say certain things at the end of your videos. Um, but by doing that, then, you know, it starts to build in into their process as they're making or doing to remember to post it on each week. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it, it's not always like 100 percent of people, but you, you will get a percentage that regularly do that. Yeah. Jessica, would you mind mm -hmm. sharing that um, YouTube um, channel that you've got? And we, we can um, have a look. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's just um, an illustration one. So it's not specific to um, sport. It's just general. Um, but Sorry for having to abruptly end the session. I hate doing that, but there's, there's sometimes no option because <laughs> after because the conversations are so are so good. But um, I think we might have to schedule in more time for breakout sessions in any future webinars. But everybody should be coming back in a minute. I think. So yeah, yes. no, coming back. Hey everyone, hopefully we're back, almost all back together in the, in the same room. Is that everyone? Blinda, I think, 
think so. Yeah, looks like it. I, I did actually count any, how many were there previous, previously. I think I'm missing one person, but I'm sure they'll be back shortly. Maybe they got what they wanted out of it already. <laughs> Um, so 15 minutes left then. So just a couple more examples to talk through. And again, things that hopefully are really easy, easily replicated um, with your own initiatives and, and programs. Um, I did intend to get to the chat about 10 minutes earlier, but there isn't a huge amount um, to go. So we shouldn't overrun. Um, so we're going to look at some school sessions now and um, I'll briefly touch on public programming at the end, just very briefly, but I'm not really wanted to cover it in too much detail given that we're looking more at sessions really with with specific groups today can everyone see that again yeah this, you should be able to um so this is a, a very brief video in fact i'm probably only going to play the first 10 seconds of it but an example of a session we did um a couple of months back now when um well marcus rashford's still in the news but certainly when marcus rashford was on a name on everyone's lips uh, in 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 the news. Um, why did Rashford try so hard to help children in poverty? That's um, a really good question. I like that question. Um, if you, you can watch lots of interviews um, where Marcus Rashford talks about this. And the reason he was so, he's so passionate about it, I think, is because of his, his upbringing. So he grew up not that far from where you are um, in Withenshaw. And he talks about when he was younger, having to have free school meals at school. And so that's just a very brief clip um, from a school session we did recently. And the what I'm trying to illustrate, I suppose, with this is, um, and unfortunately for us, I suppose, when it comes to putting together uh, an offer, is there isn't really a one size fits all approach um, to engage in schools specifically during COVID. Our school inquiries have been really varied. Uh, um, and, you know, some schools back in September, actually, we were still open in September, the museum for a period. Some schools actually wanted to visit us physically still, albeit socially distanced in very small numbers, um, which we could accommodate, you know, very small groups. Um, we did actually deliver, it seems mad now, but we did deliver four school sessions in the museum with everyone socially distanced to very small groups in August and September. Um, some groups are wanting uh, lectures. Some of them are wanting, you know, a version of our normal offer that they book every year, like our football and local history session for primary schools. But at the same time, a lot of schools, and one trend we've noticed is that a lot of teachers, because the curriculum's kind of all over the place and because teaching's kind of all over the place at the moment in terms of how much contact time students are getting and the situation with exams being up in the air or postponed or canceled altogether, a lot of teachers are taking the opportunity to look at you know, responding to news stories and social issues. And that's been great for us because, um, you know, sport and the impact of COVID on sport is, is definitely something, you know, that we you can deliver talks on regardless of what sport you're looking at. So uh, the example I've shared there was a talk we did with a school in Withenshaw, um, which is where Marcus Rashford is from, uh, a primary school in Withenshaw. And we ended up delivering the talk to several schools in, in Manchester generally. And um, as you could see there, it was, quite, it was quite an impactful talk. It was just a QA. and a I had some general objects, but not really very much because we don't have much on Marcus Rashford, just newspaper articles and one or two pictures of Rashford objects you have on display. And um, it was about a 45 minute Q&A all about Rashford and free school meals. And this had a real tangible, you know, free school meals would have clearly have had an impact on this school, given where the demographic of where the school was in, in Manchester. Um, and it was a really, you know, it was a really nice, strong uh, talk to be able to do. It's not part of our core offer, but it just shows that sometimes it is worth taking on these. Um, if you get this random request from a school, 
not that we wanted to turn it into a media story, but we asked the school beforehand, were we okay to record it? Could we share clips on social media afterwards? And as you can imagine, given that Rashford, you know, was in the news at the time and free school meals was high on the agenda for schools, it got quite a lot of engagement when we shared little 10 second, 20 second clips on on Twitter following the talk. And, and the school obviously were, were pretty happy with that too. Black Lives Matter in football again. Schools have, have asked for requests on that. Talks around citizenship in football. Um, you know, British values and citizenship are, are a priority for, for primary schools and secondary schools still. It sounds, you know, kind of clunky, the term British values, but um, it is certainly something that's on, you know, on the school curriculum and something which um, primary schools will be looking at. And football's a really good filter and sport's a really good filter, a, a really more approachable way of um, looking at a topic, British values, which can be quite um, clunky and teachers aren't always necessarily confident teaching British values. So they'll use um, the rule of law in football, citizenship in football, tolerance and equal opportunity in football. They'll use that as the filter, sport as the filter to to approach that topic. And Black Lives Matter is perfect for that because, you know, it's, obviously been big in sport and football recently we tried to stick to our set schools offer but yeah overall we have been able to respond to one or two one-off requests because there hasn't been a one-size-fits-all um, and these are a couple of pictures we've taken from the school sessions we've done so far so as i said try and if you are um delivering sessions with schools even if it's just one or two um, do try and get buy-in from the teachers um, to get photos of the students watching the session or engaging in the session, you know, dressing up. There's only so many screenshots of Zoom calls you can share on Twitter or on Facebook or wherever you're marketing your school's offer. It's not particularly engaging, unfortunately. Um, so here are some photos of um, some of the sessions we've delivered over the past couple of months of the students dressed up in their World War I, um, First World War, replica uh, uniforms and football kits from when we did the football and first of war session with the school in, in November. And then a very rare occasion here of a college of a university group, in fact, with their cameras on. And we'll talk about this at the end. It's one of my last slides, but um, one thing to consider is yeah, teaching into the void. So presenting to a room of blank faces or no screens that are on, but in this case, they're all happy to be on screen, which was a rarity. Um, another example, which again, I'm only going to briefly touch on, but do have a look in your own time, is First Eleven. It's again, a very simple um, pre-recorded video series we've done, which features all those images that I talked about before. We are really lucky. We've got lots of images. Some of them are just photos on mobile phones. The collections team have took, um, but we've managed to make them they're of a decent enough quality for us to include in these videos. So these videos are essentially slideshows, really. There's there's no sort of editorial skill to them. You can use um, iMovie or Windows Movie Maker to produce these videos. And I've just recorded them with a simple voiceover. And I'm the only person actually of my team who has a, an external microphone. So everyone else's voiceovers have been done using their mobile phone. And my tip is sort of simple audio tip i suppose is maybe try and i uh, one suggestion i have is record any audio with a duvet over your head because the duvet or pillows will um will dull any of the outside sound there'll be less echoey you can almost get a studio quality recording would you believe with a mobile phone and the duvet i mean my partner comes into the room and gets confused as to why i'm under the duvet but a duvet over your head and you can get a pretty decent audio quality so all these videos are our slideshows of our collection objects, photos essentially um, from our collections with um, audio script over the top of it that I've recorded again, you can record on your mobile phone and we just do them on different topics and we try to link them to school sessions or we try to link them to areas of the curriculum as well. So the early history of football one's the one which I think would probably be most relevant for everyone in this group. That's the one I would recommend you watching because that's the one that's really strongly tied to that uh, GCSE A-level um, history of sport sort of area. Uh, this is an example, but I won't play it for you in case there's any delay. The final example I'm touching on is um, 
Padlet, which is a, um, again, it's going back to what can you use? What free platforms can you use to share um, school resources with teachers? And again, the problem we had here was that our website is very clunky. The museum's website is very clunky and it's not a place where teachers are going to go to find school resources because it's just not been set up as a learning site um but padlet has been so padlet is one of several websites you can use just padlet.com and it's just a simple um this is the interface that we have and for each of our um, core school sessions so for our 11 um, most popular school sessions we've just put together a simple web page with resources for teachers so this is usually what we share with teachers as a pre or post session resource. So this did exist prior to lockdown. Each of these sessions we deliver in the museum and we'd share with the teacher following their visit. We share this with them and they could use this um, for classroom learning afterwards. We've now just repurposed it as a, as a home learning resource. So this is an example. And um, again, I'll share the link with you afterwards. Do have a good browse. Um, but this is our football and British value session. So as again, I said before, using football as the jump off point for teachers at primary and secondary to look at citizenship and um, sort of social cultural elements. And on here, it features the teacher brief for what the session actually looks like. A couple of videos we've done on the topic, which again are just glorified slideshows if I'm being blunt. Um, and a couple of, they don't necessarily need to be things from our website. They're just things from, um, you know, from just research that I've done for the teachers already in terms of good websites, charities for them to look at on the topic, like show racism, the red card. So a lot of these resources aren't even resources that we've done. It's things on BBC Bite Size that are on the same topic. Just simple, um, a simple web page that you can share with teachers that can complement, um, you know, video content that you're producing or a live Zoom call that you're doing with a, with a school. And that it's free to do. Um, the formatting's all done for you. It's just like um, a mood board, I suppose, is the best way of describing it. A web page with lots of different resources. Um, and it's all formatted in there for you. There's no sort of, um, you don't need any web experience or website experience to, to, to use this site. So just last couple of slides then before we finish, teaching into the void. My tips for this then, um, practice filming yourself and watch yourself back, ask for feedback. Um, before I worked in museums, I worked in the youth charity sector and um, we did a lot of assemblies and school sessions um, and it was pretty cringe, but every time we had to deliver a new school session, we would be filmed doing that assembly. Um, to nobody essentially so every time we had a new assembly to deliver um we were got filmed doing the assembly and everyone in our team had to watch us back <laughs> doing the assembly and critique it so um yeah just don't be sort of too proud i suppose when it comes to stuff like that it's new for all of us so do record yourself doing the presentation um before you know and watch yourself back send it on to somebody your peers to review it um, if you're not confident with the script, if you don't know things off by heart, if you're worried about losing your sort of way, you can use your laptop as an auto cue. Um, so I haven't got the script up in front of me, but I could easily now just have a script in front of me and you would be none the wiser that I had an auto cue script in front of me. And all you need is a, a mouse really with a slide, a slider on it. And you can slide up and down the script and you know, nobody will be any the wiser that you're using your laptop as an auto cue. Have a cabled internet connection if possible. Um, use the interactive function. So I only asked at the, you know, at the start to use the chat function. So I haven't really practiced what I preached, but if you have a paid Zoom account, you can use polls, you can use the chat function. We use the polls with sport and memories. We use them with our school groups. The tutor will usually leave their camera on, so do focus on them. If everyone else in the call has their camera off, and all the teachers, you know, every teacher's going for this at the moment as well. I have, you know, we all have friends, I'm sure, who are teachers, and it is quite frustrating. Um, my mum's a teaching assistant, 
And I think she's finding it tricky with all the teachers in her class having their cameras off at the moment. Um, so yeah, try and focus on the one person, I suppose, the teacher who does have their camera on and embrace the silence. Um, I don't know if I've given a good example of this today, but your delivery will likely be more measured um, on a video call than it would be in person. So in person, it's quite frantic. You know, you've got other things to deal with. The environment's slightly less controlled if you're doing it within a museum or within your cultural venue. On a video call, everyone's muted. You know, you have a lot more time to sort of be measured and um, sort of embrace the, the the breaks, I suppose, and be more dramatic perhaps with your with your delivery, um, and embrace that sort of silence and the fact that you know people might. It's I don't know. You, you at least you're not seeing students checking their phone or on WhatsApp or Instagram during the sessions, like it sometimes might be the case in the museum itself. And pre-session instructions are really important. So ideally in a meeting, ideally with a school session, you'll want a pre-session meeting with that teacher. Um, and it's vital, I found, because you're really relying on the teacher to um, be your eyes and ears within the classroom. One thing, some of these things are super simple, but I didn't think about them uh, until I delivered my first session. But things like if you're going to ask questions during the session, and the students are all in a classroom together. So obviously in a month's time when students are hopefully back in a classroom together, if you're gonna ask a question and the only microphone in that classroom is the teacher's laptop microphone at the, at the front of the classroom, you aren't gonna hear the response of the student at the back of the classroom. So you need to make sure that you get that buy-in from the teacher beforehand that the teacher will repeat responses from students if you're asking questions that they'll repeat them so that you can hear them because it does get awkward if you're trying to hear students at the back of the classroom and also that the teacher is aware that if you're providing a loan box so if you are sending posting a small box of handling objects um, to the school prior to the session taking place the teacher knows exactly when in the session you're going to ask that teacher to whip out the football shirt or to show the football boot or the football at the start of all of this, I was quite precious about sharing my scripts with teachers. I didn't want to share the full session with them because then why would they pay for the session if they could just deliver it themselves? Um, but you do need to be really clear with the teacher before a session starts, when you're expecting them to yeah, show off objects, when you're expecting um, audience participation, and um, just creating that buy-in with the teacher is really important. Um, and the teacher has to put in that time with you. And if they're not prepared to meet you beforehand, especially if you're trialing the session for free, I'm sure there are lots of schools, especially in this circumstance, who'd be willing to um, put in that, the teachers will be willing to put in the time and speak to you beforehand. If they're getting the session for free, the teacher should be prepared to meet with you, you know, and talk this through for half an hour or an hour beforehand. Um, to make sure it runs smoothly. So summaries then and top tips, um, check your audience need. What are teachers currently having trouble teaching from home and how can you help fulfill that need? So in our case, it was a local history element. It was sort of sticking to our curriculum, getting football into the curriculum. Um, our GCC and A-level P offer, we knew that we could deliver pretty quickly. And with our Sporting Memories group, it was providing a social uh, space for, for the guys and girls in that, in that group. Choose a platform and stick to it. You'll easily be, you'll be able to gain a, an audience quicker if you just stick to one or two platforms. Set realistic targets. You aren't going to be able to engage the same numbers you would have been able to in person. Um, so every school session that we deliver is, you know, is, is huge for us at the moment. You know, we've only delivered probably 20 odd since probably not even 20, about 15, 16, I think, since September. So we're not delivering them in the same numbers, anywhere near the same numbers that we were doing in the museum. Consider the long-term value of the content you're producing. So all the videos that we've produced that I showed you, the kicking off your creativity, the first 11, you know, collections-based stories, they will have um, we'll use those beyond lockdown. So although they're useful for teachers at the moment, 
they'll become part of our pre and post visit resources. So when schools visit the museum, those videos will be offered to them after their visit or before their visit. The um, live sessions that we're doing in lockdown, are they going to become part of your offer beyond COVID? So what's stopping you doing these digital and virtual sessions that you're doing now? What's stopping you from doing them um, you know, in six, 10, 11 months time to schools who otherwise wouldn't be able to visit your venue, schools that are, you know, down south or in the US or in Australia, what's stopping you from, you know, you can deliver those long term. And I know there are a couple of examples in our breakout rooms of organizations who have quite um, a disparate group or quite a, a group that's quite spread out. The virtual sessions are probably going to be part of your offer forever i think if you do them well and you use this as a trial period you know and you can get your participants um confident using the platforms then this could be a way of of, of running it long term and find participants who are willing um, to collaborate with you so use local artists and local um, authors they don't necessarily charge. They might be wanting to engage the same groups as you as you do. They might be a bit of a loose end at the moment. They might be used to delivering in person and getting used to delivering online. So you can trial sessions and work with them for pre-recorded or live content. I haven't mentioned it, but I will share some of these examples with you. Some of the public program stuff we've we've done over lockdown. So we have done an oral history project called um, Game of Our Lives, which we got our, I know a lot of people here from an age-friendly perspective. We got our um, Sport and Memories group members to feed into that. We recorded Zoom calls with them and we used the audio, asked them about their favourite memories of football. We clipped that audio down to, you know, a neat one minute, two minute clip, shared them on social media and it snowboard um, where we were getting people who were, weren't in our Sporting Memories group submitting one minute clips that they've recorded on their phone. And now we've got this really nice bank of oral histories that we collected when football fans aren't allowed to go into stadiums, getting them reminiscing about their favourite, um, you know, favourite matches that they've been to. And, and TalkSport actually picked up on that and shared the, the audio clips, some of these audio clips on, on one of their shows. We ran the Football Writing Festival, our annual event. We ran that online in October. That, again, is available to watch back on YouTube. It's a super simple webinar series we did with um, authors. Again, is that a way that you can generate an audience, just some pre-recorded one-on-one Zoom calls with people that you work with um, usually? We produced some content for our um exhibition um, which is currently online so we turned what was a what was previously a museum trail into an activity book and we ran a competition where um, children got to design their own kit and the winners actually got their kit made so here is um, a chap who who one of the winners of that competition designed a football kit super simple idea like you know not rocket science at all um, and we got we had dozens, we had hundreds of entries, in fact, um, for, for that competition. It's a nice home learning um, lockdown activity that we could offer. And um, I've overrun, so I appreciate some of you might need to leave, but um, these are our, um, my contact details, I suppose. So our department account where you can follow all the work we're doing is NFM Communities. Uh, Padlet is where all of those school resources are, those worksheets that I mentioned. Our clunky website that I mentioned, um, where all our resources are on the website, so you can sort of compare and contrast, is nationalfootballmuseum.com forward slash communities. And our YouTube channel, if you just search National Football Museum, you'll see all the video content, um, sort of pre-recorded video content that we're sharing with schools, you'll find on there. And that's it for me. And, and feel free to stick around. I'm happy to answer questions. I can stick around. But um, otherwise, thanks for thanks for listening today. Thank you, Christian. That was fab. As, as we mentioned, we'll circulate these um, slides. So don't worry about trying to scribble down all of this. Is there an echo? My voice is echoing. There is slightly, but there was on mine as well, Kate. I'm not sure what it is. OK. Um, yes, if you do have any questions, um, Please ask them now and we'll we'll get through a couple um, if you have got a bit of time to stay. I know there was one very specific one earlier, Christian, which I noted down, which was, um, how do you make the smell jars? 
Yeah, so um, I could share some photos actually, um, but um, the website we use, I'm trying to remember the name of the organization, they're based up in Rochdale. So you can buy some and they're not particularly dear. Um, if I type in Smile Jars Museum quickly, I might be able to get a result. Um, but um, oh God, I can't remember the name of them off the top of my head. But um, yeah, so we use, there are, is an organization that we use who have hundreds of different smell jars. But in terms of making your own, um, we just got some very small ramekin. Ramekins, I guess, like very tiny jars that you'd otherwise put jam in or, or something. And some cotton buds or cu cotton pads. And we'd soak the cotton pads in um, in whatever we wanted to make the smell jar out of. So they are quite overpowering because the smell gets kept in the in the jars and the seal tight jars. So um, in the case of um, liniment or albus oil, sort of you know smell anything related to um, footballers clearing their airways so they could play play better, um, we soak cotton pads. Uh, in that the same with bovril so we'd spread some bovril um between two cotton pads and stick them together so that you can't see the bovril itself but they're sort of wrapped up in cotton pads um the same with halftime oranges you could do that from home relatively easy i'm trying to think of other examples tobacco we actually did sprinkle tobacco in um tobacco leaf uh, yeah, I mean, there's sorts of examples that you can think of. You let your imagination go wild with that one. But yeah, very small sort of um, seal tight jars, uh, glass jars and um, cotton pads and soak those in, in your selected smell. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I think that's probably really useful. <laughs> yeah, make your own perfume. <laughs> we haven't got any other questions cropping up. Um, if you do have any questions that come up, please feel free to get in touch with us and we can get back to you. Um, yeah. And we've got a session next week. I don't know if you've seen, it's the last one in our series, which is about getting funding for your digital project. So that's at 11 next Thursday and it's with Joe Boardman. Um, so that should be a good one as well. Um, but if we don't have any other questions, um, thank you last, very last much, chance. Jim. And thank you everybody. Oh, for did it need, Anita, Anita, I think. Just, just one from oh, Anita. Sorry, Anita. <laughs> sorry, there's always one, isn't there? Um, I was just wondering how you make the um, primary school sessions sort of interesting and exciting, because when you do it in, in real life in the classroom, you have, you know, lots of activities every, you know, 10 minutes or so. Yeah. Um, and when you're delivering online, of course, it's it's a much more, well, it's much less activity based, isn't it? How how yeah. how you go about making them exciting and dynamic and also how long they are yeah so they are shorter and you're right there's no sort of way around it they're not as it, they're, they're not going to be as exciting as they are in person unfortunately um the loan boxes have certainly helped i know that's tricky in this situation but certainly when we were in tier two and tier three and we although the museum was closed we were able to get into the museum and that was really useful and as i mentioned at the, at the start we knew we had a good handling collection and we knew we could pretty quickly put together loan boxes using those handling objects for the for the sessions that we were going to be marketing um so those those helped certainly the objects um the video contents helped as well though it, you have to use it at your own peril i suppose in a live in a live situation the question and answers do help but again creating that teacher buy-in the thing we're looking at now and i think this is definitely why next next week's session i think that kate suggested might be of use to um to go that next step further and make those sessions engaging so they're not just q and a's um with objects um you do you do need an element of funding most likely um it depends on what scale you want to do them on but we the museum development northwest funding that we've got is a lot of it's going towards print resources so in the case of the football and local history session we have gotten the money now to get a designer to produce a, a map, essentially an activity sheet, a map of Manchester with the different football stadiums and different historical buildings. And we've incorporated that into the session. Um, there's also a football, there's a, a crest activity. So we get them to design their own crest. And again, we've used an illustrator to sort of come up with some fun examples um, because Manchester United and Manchester City have incorporated 
um, local history into their badges. There's like the shipping canal ship on their badges and the worker bee has featured on their badges previously and on the, the, the crest of Manchester. So yeah, a lot of it is, is the handling objects and those resources, unfortunately. Um, there's no sort of way around it. It's always going to be trickier to engage on Zoom. And the teach, your know, teachers will be saying the same thing. I think there's an understanding from teachers that there is that compromise when it's done on, on video calls. But yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you find as well that it's different when you're like streaming into the classroom, when you're streaming into, or, or do you stream into children's yeah. homes, you know, when they're, when yeah. they're learning so from we, home? We haven't done any primary where the primary children have been at home. Um, we've only offered those pre-recorded. We've done the secondary school sessions and university sessions where all the students have been at individual homes. Um, at primary, yeah, it's, I'm sure it's, it's tough. Like it's tough for the teachers too. Um, there will be a difference, yeah. So we can't send those handling objects out to each individual, um, each individual, you know, home, yeah. can we? I suppose, I suppose they could make their own memory boxes. That could be an activity, couldn't it? Yeah, so that's something that I've noticed a few museums have done. They've said, like, what they've done instead is where they would have the Jewish Museum did a really good training session on this, actually. And they said they usually have, you know, an old book at some point. And they asked the students in advance to get the oldest book in their house and to bring that into it. And they asked the students to smell the book and leaf through the, the pages. And how do we know it's an old book? And um a lot of the um, sensory elements as well. So that's actually where I got the sound The sound from is the Jewish Museum on their website actually have a really good audio bank for schools and they incorporate those into their sessions. So all the sort of, um, all the folk instruments that they incorporate into their sessions because, you know, they're teaching very specifically to, to Jewish and faith schools. So, you know, it's quite a specific those schools only go to them for, for that, for that offer. So they have a really good audio bank of all these instruments and stuff. So actually, yeah, that's where I nick, that's where I nick the football rattle and the crowd noises and stuff like that. So you can still use that element, hopefully when the children are at home and that's a great idea. Yeah. Using those, do they have an old football boot or an old football in the house? The only difficulty then is when, you know, all things aren't going to be equal. You know, one child might just have his dad's trainer as opposed to his granddad's football boot. Um, yeah, so it, it's a balance, I suppose. But I think from my understanding with teachers, certainly that compromise is understood because they're going for it themselves in day-to-day -day teaching. Thanks. Thanks for that question. It's been, been absolutely brilliant. Thank you.